I'd like to invite Professor Angela Bolcher now to the podium. Well, thank you. It's a great privilege to be here today and be part of this panel. I was asked to speak uh, a little bit about uh, my own research and what we're doing in making materials for energy and the environment. And the materials that, that we work on are really based on trying to understand how nature makes materials. I brought an example with me today, which is an abalone shell. It's a marine gastropod that's made out of calcium carbonate. It's 98% by mass calcium carbonate, but 2% by mass protein, yet has really um, many fantastic qualities in terms of materials properties. But as a material scientist, something that's even more interesting to me is how do you give genetic information to a, a non-living structure? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. So um, I wanted to um, first thank my students. Everything that's done, I show you today, is uh, done by my really fantastic students at MIT and in collaboration with many other groups. The goal of our research really is to give genetic information and give materials that haven't had the ability to evolve over time um, the potential to have some qualities, like being able to made, be made under environmentally friendly conditions, be made at room temperatures and pressures, not use toxic materials and not add toxic materials back into the environment. And this abalone shell was made, um, well, maybe next slide. This abalone shell was made in the ocean about 500 million years ago during the Cambrian geologic time period. It took this uh, organism about 50 million years to get really good at making materials. And we just had recruitment weekend for graduate students at, at MIT. And when I sell a project to a student, it's really hard for me to say, I had this great project, but it takes about 50 million years uh, to get to the kind of material we want to be able to make. So over the last 10 years in my group, what we've done is we've tried to speed that process up. We've tried to find solutions to be able to give biology a new toolkit to work with many different elements on the periodic table, not just elements that they've evolved over this uh, geologic time period to be able to make. And so when a, when a male and female abalone get together, they pass on the genetic information that says, this is the code of how to build an exquisite uh, material under environmentally friendly conditions. Here it is. Same with the diatoms that are shown in the bottom, glaciers structures in the, in the ocean um, that have the genetic sequence to build glass at ocean temperatures and build really beautiful different, different shapes. And so we focused on what if organisms had the opportunity to use more of a periodic table, not just calcium and uh, phosphate and iron and, um, and, and silica. What if they could use other elements on the periodic table and they could also genetically code the synthesis of a battery or a solar cell in this uh, instance? And so the, um, the work is really focused on simple organisms like bacteria and viruses and yeast trying to convince them to use the rest of the periodic table and make a structure that we're interested in. I always say that uh, we use simple organisms. I have a two-year-old, and it's hard to get, get them to do anything that they don't want to be able, that they don't want to do. But when you're working with simple organisms, you can convince them to start using other kinds of, kinds of building blocks. And so in this instance here, it's how do you go from a DNA sequence to a self-assembling battery that's on the same, uh, has a, the, the same performance as batteries made under other kinds of conditions. And so there's, uh, we're interested in many different um, um, significant problems, energy, healthcare, and the environment. And to us, understanding how to control materials at the nanoscale, I think, could be a, have a big impact on, on many of these different um, challenges. And so the idea is to take a small collection of atoms and control their crystal orientation, their size, their shape, and what's next to them. And by doing that, you can have a, um, a big impact in performance for solar cells and batteries and fuels. CO2 sequestration and storage, uh, more abundant materials, water purification, therapeutics, and imaging. And I'm a material scientist, so everything to me is a material. And uh, so if I'm making it um, for solar cells, I'll show you an example today. Materials that we made for, for solar cells, increasing the efficiency of inexpensive solar cells, are the exact same materials we're using for, for um, imaging ovarian tumors. And so going back to this idea of controlling materials on the nanoscale and how it works in biology, um, life has already given us a wonderful toolkit of, of, um, of molecules like DNA and antibodies and proteins and, and ribosomes that are already on the molecular level. And these are, are proteins and molecular machines in the body that can already control molecules on the nanoscale and can control uh, inorganic materials on the nanoscale. And so we think it's a wonderful place to start to be able to put these ideas together for, for new kinds of functionalities. And if you look at materials that are already made in nature, there's a coccolithophorid. It's a unicellular algae made out of calcium carbonate, already on the micron and nanometer scale. This abalone shell here that has uh, nanometer scale um, 
uh, tablets that stack on top of each other in a brick wall-like structure that are controlled at the DNA sequence. This organism has a DNA sequence that controls the proteins that control the structure. Same with diatoms and magnetotactic bacteria that make small single domain magnets. And so the, the way that this works in nature is that organisms in the ocean have proteins. These proteins are encoded by the DNA. And these proteins have sequences that can grab atoms out of the environment. In the case of the shell, they can grab calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate, and start building up these inorganic materials. And so what we decided is, let's find an organism that can do the same thing for a semiconductor material, a magnetic material, or any material of interest. And so how do you do that? Again, I said we're trying to get past that 50 million year um, um, time scale, and so we do a billion experiments in the lab at a time where we genetically uh, engineer simple organisms to work with uh, semiconductor materials and magnetic materials and, and different kinds of metal oxides. And it's all based on a, a bacteriophage, which you heard about uh, earlier today, which is, a, which is a virus that infects bacteria. Uh, it's, a, it's an object that's um, 900 nanometers across and 6 man nanometers in, in diameter, and it has the DNA sequences that code for the proteins that make it up. And so what we want to do is c take that virus and have it learn how to work with battery materials or solar materials over a, a three-week period of time, clone it, make millions or billions of copies of it, and then get it to uh, work on materials that we're interested in. And it's all done through um, pretty simple genetic engineering where you go in and, and cut and paste DNA sequences that code for uh, peptide sequences. And so how do you get from a DNA sequence to a functional device? Um, how do you um, do that manipulation? We do a billion experiments at a time and then search through in a trial and error method to find the one that can build a better solar cell or the one that can build a better battery. And so we do it through a process of taking a billion viruses, force them to interact with any kind of material we want. We take the one out of a billion that works and then we amplify it up and make, make a million copies. We go through this kind of process um, about five times looking for the survival of the fittest, the one that can grow a better battery. And then we take that one and we can, we can clone it up. And so the kinds of um, things that we've focused on, oops. So the other idea is trying to put together uh, two materials that are very hard to, to mix together. In this case, we're trying to put carbon nanotubes um, and, uh, and nanoparticles together. And we do it through evolving the virus to do two things. One, pick up a carbon nanotube, and second, to grow a, uh, a semiconductor material. And so we focus on, uh, and this is a cartoon my students made of, of my collaborator, Paula Hammond. We want to give genetic information to solar cells, to batteries, to, um, to catalysts. I, I founded a company that, that uh, developed catalysts that convert uh, methane into ethylene and ethylene into larger-based um, carbon chains for uh, drop-in fuel replacement or for, um, for plastics. We, I have an example here of a, of a yeast-based material that we evolved for the ability to take CO2 from a mock coal uh, plant and convert it into building supplies. In this case, it's a green tile that's made uh, biologically that could replace the, the flooring um, uh, that you walked in on today. Um, another example is um, evolving um, structures that could find tiny tumors, um, one millimeter size ovarian tumors, non-invasively um, in patients, and then developing new photocatalysts for converting um, water or uh, CO2 into, into fuels. This is an example of the, of the battery. We've been working on uh, evolving um, uh, biology to make new anodes and cathode materials. And we've, um, we've done this by these two of my really fantastic students. They took a virus and they evolved it to be able to pick up single wall carbon nanotubes. And then they had a second gene where they evolved it to, to grow at room temperature conditions iron phosphate material and then have the, this um, biological structure self-assemble itself um, into a battery electrode. And uh, here's an example of that, uh, that battery um, right here. This is one that went to the, the White House um, because it was a, a very a great, a great battery at the time that we built it that was built biologically, that was built at room temperature using non-toxic materials and that assembled itself. Um, basically, what the thing that was really interesting for us is that you could go through genetic engineering and you could find, um, you could make your batteries better and better as a function of time. And in the end, we produced, um, through several rounds of uh, a selection and uh, engineering, we produced uh, batteries that were um, as good as um, the, the state-of-the-art batteries at the time. Um, so we're looking at, at, at using that for other kinds of battery materials going beyond lithium-ion batteries. We think biology has a role for that as well. Um, through uh, selection and evolution, we've um, started evolving viruses for lithium air batteries um, that uh, are getting around some of the problems um, with cathode materials that are um, currently um, limiting lithium air batteries as a material. 
We've been able to do the same thing with solar cells. These are disensitized solar cells, which are inexpensive solar cells. We thought that uh, biology had a place for increasing the efficiency of solar cells. The way that a disensitized solar cell works is you have a dye, you shine light, you um, promote an electron. That electron is injected into titanium nanoparticles, then has to make its way through this random network to the current collector. What we decided to do was to evolve a, a virus to pick up carbon nanotubes, sit in there, and act as a direct connection to the current collector. And we did it through genetically engineering viruses to pick up single-walled carbon nanotubes. And then um, we put 0.1% biology in our, uh, our active solar cell, and in 0.1% biology increased the efficiency by 33%. And so in this case, a little bit of biology uh, selection to evolution um, went a long way towards uh, device performance. We use that same material that I described today to um, look for um, one millimeter um, tumors in ovarian cancer, and this is work that's done in collaboration with uh, um, uh, a medical school in, in Harvard. The surgeons use our new probe to um, look inside uh, it's in animals at this stage to find tumors that they couldn't find um, without our probe. And in the last um, few minutes, I just wanted to say that, that we think that this technology um, could be important for um, for fuels as well, and it's kind of a different kind of biofuel. In this case, biology creates a new catalyst, and that catalyst is involved in converting natural gas, which is a very um, stable molecule, into ethylene. And normally this is done through a, a cracking process where you take a larger chain um, molecule and you break it down into smaller pieces. But we think the way to go is to start with a, a one carbon and add a carbon at a time. And so through um, people have been interested in this problem for about 30 years, and through um, about 18 months of selection and evolution, we are able to find the catalyst that makes this, makes this possible. So that's, uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks.